Looking at the infrared lens and the ultraviolet lenses to detect those frequencies of energy, have we not? It does not say that there are not other energy sources that are available. Here's an example that Mike, uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Pappas has shown that the energy being emitted through the nucleus and to the outer uh, energy spectrum of the atom is a directional force because the potential energy coming into our third dimension to create our universe as we know it, it has native intelligence to create our mass. Uh, it has the abilities to create and sustain our life form. And that energy potential is a one-way, so it's a one-way gate valve. Now we come to the point that as you expose the atoms of the water molecule under electrical stress, you are now starting to oscillate the atom under electrical stress. So unlike Gould and, and, and the others, we are now applying electrical stress of opposite polarity across the atoms of the water molecule to cause particle oscillation as an energy generator by way of electrical stress. So now we are causing the hydrogen and oxygen atom to increase in energy that every time you will pulse it under enormous electrical stress, it adds more energy into the hydrogen and oxygen atom. Once you terminate the electrical stress pulse, it now shuts off the flow of energy into the atoms and then that energy is now available to be utilized as work. So basically what's happening, the more you will oscillate the combustible gas atoms under electrical stress, more and more and more and more energy is going in to the combustible gas atoms. You now, anywhere along that line, can light the gas and release this enormous amount of energy that's available to us at a zero point energy. And we now have a way to power our trains, planes, boats, and any other form of uh, device uh, that we have in our economy. We now take it, this is an example that not only we're energy primitive, we can now pluck the electrons to destabilize the mass, open up the energy aperture even further, and now release even more energy. Now a classic example of this on a thermonuclear device, there's not enough energy in an atom to blow up anything. And you can prove this out very simple by taking an electron and pass it through a resistor and you'll get X, one X amount of heat. Uh, proton is 1,840 times greater than that of electron, so if I would pass it through the resistor in the opposite polarity attraction force, you'll find out you get 1,840 times more heat out of it. Where is there enough energy in an atom to blow uh, and destroy New York City? What actually happens in uranium 235 and 238, so you have the clustering of the protons, which allows the clustering now of the energy apertures. And then when you blow the atom apart by a neutron bombardment, it actually destroys and rips open this energy aperture in a very violent way. And this is the energy that it really is releasing into our environment under that hostile environment that will blow up the city. What we're actually doing is taking a very natural phenomena that occurs in thermal gas ignition, and we're simply enhancing its control and releasing it to the energy level that we so desire. Now we get to the hydrogen fracturing uh, point of the technology. This is where we take the atoms of uh, the uh, water molecule, we take it in subcritical state, uh, we pluck off their electrons, we add photon energy in it to take it to a very high stable state, and we are now duplicating the muon process that had been very successfully demonstrated in universities uh, in this country, where they would take a muon and trick the hydrogen atom and accept the muon, eject its natural electron, the muon would decay in a billionth of a second, there was a readjustment within the, the nucleus of the atom and says, oh, I don't have an electron anymore. I must release energy. And so when it tries to stabilize, it flexes and releases this enormous amount of energy coming through our, uh, our atom structure. Here is where we're taking and, and uh, causing uh, at least four to five electrons to come out of the oxygen atom. Uh, normally, when an atom has at least 50% of its electrons missing, it acts like a little baby and it blows apart. In this particular case, what we're doing is exposing the hydrogen atom to photon energy. It absorbs it. It causes the, their electrons to migrate farther away from the nucleus. Its electric attraction force becomes weakened, whereas the oxygen atom is eight times bigger. And so when you take it on the gas ignition, you have, and as the unlike atoms try to come together to form the water molecule, it has an avalanche effect. Mass density occurs. An enormous amount of energy is being released. The Projected and energy yield release is anywhere and beyond up to and beyond 2.5 million barrels of oil per gallon of water. 
Now, we don't need to get to that size because uh, we don't want to destroy the hydrogen and the oxygen uh, process. Okay, we've done all this wonderful research in using water as fuel, but if you can't system engineer it, it doesn't mean anything, right? So you're finding out a lot of talks uh, in the symposium. This has been confirmed now in many, many governmental and university laboratories around the world. This is where we're now taking the water molecule, uh, meter mixing it, and exposing it between two high voltage zones of opposite polarity, shut off the uh, current of flow around 40 kilovolts or, or higher, and we now instantly convert water into thermal explosive energy. Now, this device does not create energy. The only thing we're doing is utilizing the energy, energy that's already there in the atom. It's a triggering process, so it's like a thermonuclear process, but this one here is under a control state. As a result of that, we developed what we call a water fuel injector that simply replaces the spark plug or the injector port in your diesel engine or your spark plug in your gasoline engine, or we replace the nozzle injector in a jet engine and literally fly it off of water. Now, uh, in the environmental issue, uh, they always talk about that the, the, the fluid inside the air conditioner is causing the destruction of the ozone. It's not what's causing it. And when a jet engine is flying at the, in the stratosphere, you'll find out the O3 goes to the engine. It breaks down to O2 and covalent links up to the aviation fuel. It creates the chemical oxides going out that's reducing the sunlight, and it's, we're destroying our ozone. And I will tell you, if we keep allow this to continue on, you're going to create enormous holes in the ozone, and it's very well possible that our atmosphere will leak in outer space because the ozone is the only thing that's really covalently or electrovalent linking up to keep our atmosphere in. If it does occur, I will tell you that it's possible that we can become another Mars, totally absence of any form of an environment, uh, uh, atmosphere. Here's where we're now taking the resonant cavity. We're tuning the dielectric value of water, and this acts as an uh, amplifier that we allow the electrical stress to be amplified and compressed, and this allows us to oscillate the water molecule atom farther and farther and farther and farther away from stable state of equilibrium, and then allow this outstretched uh, atoms of the water molecule to be ejected out of the injector, and when they come back, it flexes as an energy generator, releases the spark that ignites the gas, and that's why we now can go ahead and, re and replace the spark plug. The VIC circuit now gives us the ability to do that. The resident cavities that can do this can take on different shapes. The tapered cavity acts as a compressional wave. The, other, the lower one actually has uh, high heat uh, generation, and therefore we can vector the heat and thermal exposure energy of hydrogen to any level that we so desire from uh, zero to 90 degrees. Heretofore, that was not uh, invented uh, in the prior art. Now it became a quite a, a simple system is where we're now taking the water meter, mixing it into the, uh, what we call a water fuel cell injector to replace it the spark plug. We meter mix the water, hit it with very high voltage. We put the electrical stress across it and that energy now is released to run the car. There's an example of the water fuel injectors uh, down in the bottom. There you see it uh, replacing the spark plug on the dune buggy. We're using the latest technology, an EEPROM technology, and reducing it down to give us our cost effectiveness. Uh, the system is now in system upgrade for manufacturing. We're now using what we call a gas processor, a processor to take the ambient air, amplify it, and so therefore we're now using the internal combustion engine not to destroy the air, but we're using the uh, process to use the internal combustion engine to now repurify the air and bring it back up to the level that it was prior to the Industrial Revolution. They always ask me about what happens uh, if water freezes in the wintertime. Well, the Lord had me develop a resonant uh, uh, steam resonant technology, whereby which, since the water molecule is bipolar electrically charged, we now put a, a pulse electrical charge across the atoms of the water molecule, we stretch it, and then we release it, and it's, we're stretching like a rubber band and release it, it releases energy that heats the water, so therefore, we have a very economical way now to heat your home uh, or heat the water to prevent the water from freezing in the, in the wintertime. This technology has allowed us now to use water to even to generate electrical, uh, electrical power. Now, we had to design the system and full system development in order to get it in, in compliance. The technology is legalized on the U.S. National Security Energy Act of 1992, which says any alternate fuel source retrofitted to an internal combustion engine must be oxygenated. We use the oxygen from the water. We're the only technology in the world that has that capabilities now. 
we got the UN to announce very recently to the world, stop running all internal combustion engine off of fuel, uh, fossil fuels and do it absolutely immediately because the acceleration of the greenhouse effect that's, uh, that's now taking place. Now, all of these nice, beautiful chemical oxides that's been put in the air by the burning of fossil fuels, we now, as we're running the engine on, on water, and the, the byproduct is water mist, uh, those chemical oxides going through the engine can go through what we call an air reclaimer. And since those uh, gas uh, molecular structures are held together by an electrical attraction force, we now can simply pull them apart and take it right back to the natural state and release the, uh, uh, and to reverse the process that's been ongoing. Now the water can be slightly de-energized. Uh, there's uh, unfortunately, I mean fortunately for us, if you allow, uh, if, if there is a slight de-energizing the water molecule, the question was under EPA, are we swapping one environmental catastrophe for another? Are we going to have a lot of flat water around? The answer is no, because once you allow the water mist to be exposed to the sun, uh, it will absorb photon energy and bring it up to its original energy level. So basically, the technology is a solar device. Now, since we're only using photon energy from the sun, are we taking anything out of the environment? No. All we're doing is taking the solar energy that's coming in from the sun and, and maintain the, power, uh, the industrial base of the world uh, we, in a way, we can use the universal energy or zero point energy to amplify it. Now, NASA is looking uh, at, uh, at this technology for deep space exploration because basically what happens to the water molecule, you can take the water molecule in electrical stress, uh, release its gases, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen gases to create uh, thermal explosive energy, reunite the water molecule, cool it down, use the space of the heat sink, bring it right back through in a recycling system and keep flexing the water molecule to keep tapping into this energy source and therefore we have a fantastic economic energy source for deep space exploration as well as now have a fuel source capable for space station operations. We are, we are in industrial contracting right now. Uh, we've opened the doors to industry. Uh, we've legalized the technology under 35 U.S. Code 101. If there's any question of operability under that code in the U.S. Patent Office, come on in gentlemen, we want to see it. If we demonstrate it successfully, you get your patents. Uh, and I've always recommended all the inventors, please do not try to get a patent on an over-unit device at this stage of the game. However, the vacuum field, uh, German Vacuum Field uh, Association under Dr. Nieper has uh, confirmed a tested over-unity of this technology. Uh, the Russians and the Ukrainians have confirmed. Uh, there's people in Japan have confirmed and others have confirmed over-unity of this technology. And so we now have it confirmed by the scientific community. Uh, now I believe it's, it will go political. We can demonstrate the technology, we can say it's here, but in actuality it will not be Stan Myers to bring it in. It will be the, either you or I, the guy down the street, that will come together to bring it in.